Welcome to the Pacific Research Institute's Next Round Podcast. I'm Rowena Itron, Senior Vice President, and with me is Tim Anaya, Senior Director of Communications. Hi, Ro. How are you? Fine. Thank you, Tim. So it's it's bill deadline week at the Capitol. So what are you hearing? For our listeners who don't follow the sausage making of Sacramento, um, this week is a key deadline for bills that were introduced last year. Remember, we have a two-year legislative session. So any bills that were introduced last year that didn't make out of its first house, so in other words, an assembly bill that didn't pass the assembly last year, it has to pass the assembly by the 31st, which is um, next Monday. So it's a bit of a crunch period. I haven't heard a number of how many bills, but I would say, you know, they'll be going through dozens of bills and all of the drama centers around what we talked about last week on the podcast, which is the newly revived single payer bill, AB 1400. The Appropriations Committee approved the bill with no debate in last week's hearing on Thursday. Are they really going to approve a bill that would have a huge fiscal impact on the state, $163 billion in new taxes, um, price tag of upwards of $400 billion? Are they really going to approve such a bill with so little scrutiny. What's going to happen with the bill? Your guess is as good as mine. The Chamber of Commerce is really working hard with an industry coalition to try and stop the bill. But reportedly, the Speaker of the Assembly wants to pass the bill. That's a hard um, thing if you're a Democratic member to tell the Speaker no. But, you know, I guess the question it comes down to, if you are a Democratic member who isn't quite sure what to do on the bill, what are you most concerned about? Are you concerned about how the taxes and uh, government control of the bill are going to hurt your constituents? Or are you looking over your left shoulder at a potential primary challenger from an energized liberal base that wants single payer more than anything else? So I guess we will see when the vote goes down. Yeah. And, and the nurses unions are a big player in that. So there's a, a representative feel like they're beholden to the nurses union. Well, and they clearly are trying to make it kind of a litmus test vote in the political world. You know, on the news, the Nurses Association, the big interesting thing to me is Gavin Newsom, who is a self-described supporter of single payer. He has a single payer commission that is looking into the bill, yet he has been very cool to this bill. Um, I think it's more because it isn't his bill. What will he do if this thing starts to catch fire and move through the system? Will he sign on board or will he pump the brakes? Yeah, that'll be very interesting. So, Tim, as as two communications experts, we absolutely have to talk about about President Biden's press conference last week. I'd have to say it was probably the worst press conference in presidential history. Even the mainstream media was critical. Well, you pegged it well when we and Lance has still never forgiven us for making him watch the Democratic convention and the Republican convention. But you pegged it very well about Biden speaking style. You said he he tried tries so hard and he's straining with his prepared remarks that it really detracts from the effectiveness of them. And I think that was certainly on display with what we saw at the press conference. But the the, the tougher thing, and all of us who have been in the political world, in the political communications world, we've all had this experience, right, where they're going to be okay if they stick to the scripted remarks. But when it's time for the Q&A, you hold your breath. And if I were Jen Psaki, I probably was blue in the face. I was holding my breath so much after that press conference. I mean, when the story of the press conference is all the messes that you have to clean up, starting with Ukraine, I mean, that's a disaster by any means. You know, Tim, I'm beginning to wonder about the competency of his press team. We already know, the world knows that taking questions from reporters is not his strong suit. Why did they let him run on for two hours? I would have just kept it to 45 minutes, you know, given his skill and his poor abilities at taking questions like this. You know, look at, t- look at today. We've both been press spokespeople. All week, the, the market has been correcting. It's Monday right now. And I, last I looked, the Dow is down close to a thousand points. On a day like this, I would have probably spoken to 40 reporters on the record, and I would have been wiped out. For a president who doesn't have a lot of skill talking
talking to reporters. I can't believe they had exposed him like this. Well, that's exactly right. And some of it, they may felt they had to do it because the knock on President Trump was, well, he didn't answer questions, even though he did more press conferences than any other president that I remember. They just didn't like what he said at the press conferences. I think this was what the third or fourth press conference that Biden did during his first year in office. So I'm sure some of it was to try to be the optic, right? I'm not at death's door if I can stand here for two hours and answer all these questions. Yet his answers were so weak and feeble. He kind of re enforced all these stereotypes right. and questions about his competency. You know, and and all the the walkbacks. And you know, you felt like he almost doubled down on some of his his gaffes. Small incursions into the Ukraine is, you know, one thing, but calling into question the the legitimacy of the midterm elections if he doesn't get his voter bill passed. I don't know, Tim. You know, after decades in the Senate, you would think that these were easy questions for him to to finesse. Well, you're right to that it is political malpractice on the part of his handlers. Yes, you naturally want to take a bow and touch your accomplishments on your one year anniversary. But if this is what you get when you're doing that, well, it might have been better just to restrict his celebrations to softball interviews with Rachel Maddow or folks like that. That's right. And a a 45 minute press conference is, you know, they might have been criticized for that, but I think it would have been a lot less damaging than this. It couldn't have gotten any worse. And this is the second disastrous speech after his speech in Georgia on voting rights, which really undermined a lot of what his central tenet for being in office was about bringing people together. Um, and certainly, let's not forget our our Californian, our vice president. Um, she's not exactly uh, been much help with her communication style as well. So maybe they felt that a Biden making gaffes was better than anything else they had. Well, let's move on to to this podcast. Our our guest is Naomi Schaefer Riley, who is a a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and she focuses on child welfare issues. Uh, Her latest book is No Way to Treat a Child, How the Foster Care System, Family Courts, and Racial Activists Are Wrecking Young Lives. Um, You can get the book at your favorite bookstore. And and we brought Naomi in because children are are front and center of many issues right now, whether they are, you know, COVID-19 and in-person learning, the rising crime often committed by youth, um, drug abuse. Uh, Governor Newsom has committed multi-millions in his due budget to try and improve the, our child welfare systems, uh, including foster care and, and at-risk youth. And Naomi sheds a, a light on many of these issues. You know, if you look at the big proposals pushed by both President Biden and Governor Newsom, they really are child-centered. Child care, having government child care programs, even when they're talking about tax relief, it's always centered around children and families. The push for universal basic income, it's often pushed in the name of um, children and child poverty. So I think she gives a real interesting insight into what we probably knew you know, is the ineffectiveness of all of these various government programs, especially childcare. It's a very topical and interesting discussion of these issues that are front and center in the debate over the budget and domestic priorities. So thanks everyone for joining us. Welcome to PRI's Next Round podcast, Naomi. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. So probably the most important issue on parents' minds these days is how to make sure that their children keep up with their education and at the same time reduce the risk of their kids getting the Omicron variants. In the LA Unified School District area, 30% of students were actually absent the first day of class. Well, the science has confirmed that children are more resilient to COVID-19. So why do you think parents and teachers and, and school districts are, are still holding back on, on in-person learning? I think there are a combination of factors that are contributing to this problem. It's absolutely true, of course, that kids are at very little risk of this um, disease. I recently went and looked up some, t- some statistics and I found that uh, the mortality rate for kids from COVID is about the same as the mortality rate for kids from Little League 
league. And I don't see a lot of people pulling their kids out of uh, small baseball organizations because of the risk of death. So um, I think part of it is parents uh, are unable uh, to assess risk properly in these times. And that was probably true before COVID. Uh, Obviously, you have the factor of the teachers unions kind of not wanting to work. Um, But I also think that when we shut down our institutions, it sends a signal to parents that there is a real danger there. And so parents who may not be properly educated about the actual risks to their children are kind of taking their cues from those institutions and may be keeping their kids home, even if there is not a real risk there. So Naomi, you have a new book that came out late last year, which called No Way to Treat a Child, How the Foster Care System, Family Courts, and Racial Activists are Wrecking Young Lives. And I'm sure you can get that wherever books are sold. So you write in your book how the U.S. child welfare system has been used by activists to promote political agendas, whether it's social justice or identity politics, and that foster children have really gotten lost in bureaucracy and red tape. So let's start maybe with um, discussing the role of government child welfare agencies. How are they failing um, these kids in your view? Sure. So the first thing to kind of understand a broad overview of the system, I think, is important. Uh, There are about three million calls that come in every year in this country, children being reported to the authorities uh, for cases of suspected abuse or severe neglect. Um, About 800,000 of those calls are substantiated. That means that we do have some evidence that something definitely is going wrong uh, in those homes or with those children. That doesn't mean, by the way, that the remainder of those calls uh, did not happen. Happen, just that we don't have enough evidence one way or another. Um, we have about 2,000 deaths every year, children dying from uh, the direct result of maltreatment. Um, and then we have about 440,000 kids who are in the foster care system. Uh, that means that we have deemed the risk to their safety high enough that we have had to remove them uh, either temporarily or permanently from their parents' care. Um, so in order to understand kind of the government's role, I think the first role primarily is in ensuring children's safety. Um, These kids are are at severe risk. And I think a lot of people kind of misunderstand what that risk is. For a lot of kids, obviously, there is actual abuse going on, the kind of black eyes and broken bones that you would see reported on the front page of the paper. But a lot of our child welfare system is also being driven by the substance abuse crisis, the drug crisis that is going on in this country. So a lot of kids, especially younger kids, are suffering from severe maltreatment because their parents are unable or unwilling willing to care for them. The addiction is really getting in the way of their being able to properly feed their children, to properly supervise them, to get them adequate medical care. And when that happens over a long period of time, it's really important that we keep those children safe. Um, So that is primarily what I see as the role of government. Um, But a lot of other people see it as much more of a role of social engineering. Um, They see it as we need to improve, uh, in the words of one government official, uh, improve the well-being of all families families across the United States. And that I think is a mission that that is far too broad and also impossible to achieve. And it also makes the government, I think, lose focus on the kids who actually need our help most severely. Naomi, you also discuss in your book how racial considerations seem to have taken precedence over all factors when it comes to placing a child with a foster family. Could you discuss this trend and why it doesn't serve the child? Sure. Well, I think one thing that people are most surprised by when they begin to look into the child welfare system, and that includes both the state-run agencies, uh, sometimes they're county-run, but mostly state-run agencies, as well as the family court system that is also um, state-run. One of the things that really surprises them is how much the system revolves around the needs and desires of adults rather than the needs and desires of children. And so uh, when we are deciding, for instance, whether a child should be removed from their home or not, um, a lot of the conversation that goes on with caseworkers and judges and lawyers is about feeling sorry for the parents. It's about seeing the parents as victims, um, victims of poverty, victims of racism. Often they themselves have been in the foster care system. And I'm not saying that we should not feel bad for these folks. In fact, we should be trying to help them in whatever way we possibly can, Um, but they should not be the focus of the child welfare system. And so one of the issues that comes up repeatedly is that these parents are disproportionately proportionately the victims of racism, and that removing the children from their homes is only sort of another racial injury that they are ex- 
experiencing. So the thing to understand about the racial disparities in foster care, and it is absolutely true that Black children uh, are investigated, their cases are substantiated, and they are removed into foster care at a higher rate uh, than white families. The thing to understand is that Black children also are suffering maltreatment in this country uh, at twice the rate of their non-Black peers. Um, And Black children are actually three times as likely to die from maltreatment. So I see the foster care system, again, as kind of a way of helping the most vulnerable children. And But then you have folks out there who are much more concerned with whether the columns on their spreadsheet are coming out even, whether the number of kids in foster care is directly proportionate to their racial representation in the population. So that's kind of the first area in which this racial engineering is going on. The second one uh, is the idea that when we do remove children, whether it's uh, to foster care or whether um, their parental rights have been terminated, the idea is that these children should only be in the homes of families whose skin color matches their own. Um, This game of skin matching has been going on for a very long time. Uh, In the 1970s, the National Association of Black Social Workers came out with a statement saying that they thought it was better for Black children to remain in the foster care system or in an institution rather than being subject to live with a white family. They likened that experience to actual slavery. And so what is important to know is that there is actually no difference in the outcomes for Black children who are adopted by Black families versus Black children who are adopted by white families. Uh, When you look at all of the literature, all the sociological literature, outcomes in terms of educational uh, outcomes, emotional well-being, all these things, the transracial factor um, is really something that political activists are concerned with. But if you are concerned with the well-being of children, you should understand the most important thing for them is to be in a safe, stable, and loving home, not to worry about whether their skin happens to be the same shade as the adults who are caring for them. So when we think about about at-risk kids, the popular notion is that poverty is the primary reason that these kids are vulnerable and that the solution is really to increase welfare payments to families. But you're right that the, the reason kids are taken away from their families is not really poverty, but it's actually substance abuse. Do you expand on this? Absolutely. I think people are aware in this country of the vast problems that substance abuse has has produced uh, all across the country, 100,000 overdose deaths just last year. And those deaths are, of course, just the tip of the iceberg. Not only did those deaths leave many children without a single parent or without two parents, but those are the people who actually died. I mean, all of the people who are, you know, severely abusing drugs are not in that number. So what you have to understand, and I, I try to explain this in particular in a, in a way that parents can understand. Parenting a, a young child, an, an infant, of course, is a very demanding job. Children who are waking up at all hours of the night, who need to be fed uh, uh, very constantly, who need to be um, changed, who need to be uh, closely monitored if they spike a fever or something like that. But then you get into children getting into what I call the mobile but totally irrational stage, which is when you know they can run out the front door or touch a hot stove or, you know, don't understand uh, that they shouldn't jump into a bathtub or swallow their siblings Legos. Um, All of those things, that kind of supervision taxes even the most sober parent. And so I, I ask parents to imagine trying to do all that while you know, high or drunk, frankly, it becomes very difficult to assure a child's safety under those circumstances. And those are the cases that are really driving our child welfare problem in this country. You saw a big increase as the opioid crisis was getting off the ground in uh, the number of cases in the foster care system. I think there's been an attempt to really sort of uh, reduce those, not in my opinion, safely, frankly. But I think a lot of people really just think, oh, these happen to be cases where families are poor. And so if we just gave them more food stamps or housing vouchers um, or other forms of material support, that would solve the problem. It is true that a disproportionate number of these families are poor, but that is a case more often of correlation than causation. It, you know, it happens to be true that these families are dysfunctional in a variety of ways, and that also prevents them from 
properly financially supporting themselves. But that doesn't mean that poverty is what's causing the problem. And I also encourage people to understand that if you just sort of equate poverty and child abuse, you know, you're throwing millions of parents in this country under the bus. I mean, there are so many parents in this country who are able to raise their children safely and well, despite the fact that they don't have a lot of things and a lot of money. And so we're talking about a very small portion of the population. And I think misdiagnosing the problem as poverty, not only does it disservice to all those other families, but really doesn't help the children who need it most. Naomi, let's for a moment discuss group homes, uh, what we used to call orphanages back in the day. I asked because my niece was adopted from an orphanage run by nuns. So group homes still exist. So tell us about your research and and why for some children, this might be a better alternative. Sure. Group homes uh, do still exist in this country, although they have been, uh, their numbers have been severely decreased uh, in recent years. They used to exist uh, in large part, really more for uh, kids who came from, sometimes the the problem really was poverty in some of those homes. Um, You know, more often it was poverty in a combination of a parent who had died and another parent who couldn't you know, couldn't support them and work at the same time. It was really, um, they, they were popular before a lot of the modern welfare states and, and payments that existed to, to families that couldn't support children. But surprisingly, in many cases, they did a very good job. There's a man named Richard McKenzie who teaches uh, economics at UC Irvine. And a number of years ago, uh, when Newt Gingrich first raised the possibility of bringing back orphanages um, and people, you know, went crazy about how terrible this idea was, he actually wrote a number of articles and then a number of books talking about how his own experience was not, you know, that of, uh, you know, some Dickensian institution, but of an, of an organization that actually raised, uh, you know, him much better than his parents were capable of doing. And he had great success, he says, not despite the orphanages, but because of them. So currently, though, um, group homes are really reserved for kids who can, we cannot find foster adoptive families for. And the reason we can't find foster adoptive families for them are um, usually the the result of their age, how many siblings we're dealing with, although that's less common, or mental health or behavioral challenges. That is to say, you have kids with very high needs, and it is hard to find a family that is willing to take them in, um, risking sometimes even violence to themselves or their children if they take in these other kids. So those are cases where, you know, we, these, these kids need a certain amount of rehabilitation before it is possible to place them in a typical foster family. Unfortunately, I think because group homes have this reputation, there certainly have been cases of abuse at these homes uh, that have actually panned out. But because of the reputation these homes have earned, we have taken more and more money away from these homes, but we haven't actually found an alternative placement for many of these children. So for instance, in the last few months, You've had cases all over the country of children who have had to sleep in child welfare agency offices. Um, In Texas, there were something like 400 children uh, last year who slept in offices for, you know, multiple nights because we did not have an appropriate bed for them uh, in a group home. And so the officials are kind of wringing their hands. Uh, Texas has a a federal court that is trying to decide, you know, uh, what, what to do with its child welfare agency because they, the, the judge thinks that the agency is not uh, appropriately caring for these kids. And so the question is, if you want to take away these group homes and you want to close these beds, some of that happened under the Family First legislation, which was passed in 2018, which really placed much more restrictions on funding for these homes. If you want to take away funding for these places, you need to explain what the alternative is. Because if the alternative is kids sleeping in offices, it seems like we should keep the group homes open. So So Governor Newsom in his new budget proposed about $3.4 billion to tackle learning loss during the pandemic and also, you know, provide funding for more after school programs. He also proposed $28 million to fund foster youth support programs in community colleges and $50 million to expand state home visiting programs, in addition to a million dollars to help counties provide family finding services to expand expand the number of foster youths taken in by relatives. You know, there's also the big push 
in Sacramento and in cities across the state to provide universal basic income for young adults who came from the foster care system. That just all goes to show that California and other states are putting a lot of money into supporting foster care. But it, it, is it really providing the results that we want, supporting at-risk children so that they grow up to lead productive lives? So given that California is awash in cash these days, where would you spend these dollars if you were Newsom's child welfare czar? Uh, it would it, it would be my, my pleasure to spend them more appropriately. Um, I think the first place I would start is at the front end. Uh, we are doing a very bad job of assessing which children are at risk and um, which children are most at risk. A lot of caseworkers really don't have the appropriate level of education or training, um, and we are not giving them the tools they need to understand which kids are at risk. There's a, there was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania who died last year, uh, who was just really good on this subject and really understood uh, risk analysis. And when I asked him, you know, what he wished his students had learned uh, before they became social workers, he said he wished they had learned math. <laughs> So I said, I didn't think that was going to necessarily happen, but it is true. We actually, uh, there, there are great models out there now for using um, predictive risk modeling and predictive analytics in order to understand which kids are most at risk. We have a lot of information about these families. We know, for instance, things like if a recently incarcerated person has returned to that household, uh, we know if the family has been reported multiple times, we know if the child has been absent from school school. We know if the family has not used uh, their welfare payments recently. Um, All of these things can be signs of something seriously awry. We know if a family um, has had their heat or electricity turned off um, and and has gone for, you know, 30 days without saying anything. These are signs that something is seriously wrong in the household, and they can be a sign that we need to send out someone very quickly to assess the risk to that child. Right now, there's a pilot program in Allegheny County that's being used to give kids a risk score when a report of abuse or neglect is called in. This is not, by the way, some kind of like minority report situation where that determines whether a child has actually been abused or neglected, but it does tell us how urgently we need to investigate. So that's one place I would use the money. Um, Caseworker training is another place. Family courts are, is another big area where I don't feel we are putting sufficient resources into it. Um, the, The slowness, of family court is one of the most infuriating aspects of the system. You have kids who are maybe two years old, um, you know, who go in for a hearing and a judge says, we'll see you again in six months. That is an enormous amount of a child's life uh, frittered away with this kind of bureaucracy. Um, So whether it's we need more judges or more lawyers, or we need to institute, you know, better technology to make these courts run more efficiently, um, that is money that I am happy to put into this problem. Um, Speaking of data, I also think we could be using data to do better uh, recruitment and training of foster families. You know, there are some great faith-based organizations right now that are doing uh, the the Lord's work in terms of trying to figure out ways to get really middle-class Americans um, into foster care and treating them better and understanding which people are going to be most successful at this. And so I would be happy to sort of throw more resources into that area as well. Governor Newsom also proposed $2.7 billion to create a, a new grade. He's calling it transitional kindergarten for, for four-year-olds. Kindergarten was supposed to get kids ready for more academic work in the first grade back in my day, but proponents now argue that it's important to get kids ready for, for kindergarten. So in your work, have you found that sending children as young as four, even sometimes three, t- to school really improve their development? The, the record on this is not very good. I mean, for a long time, we've had Head Start programs, obviously, all across the country. And it's only a very small percentage of those that were really high quality uh, institutions that could really make a difference, I think, in terms of kids' later uh, academic performance. Um, You know, Head Start really has not been much of a success. And I would say, generally speaking, you know, given the failure of the K-12 system generally, giving them another year with the kids hardly seems like a recipe for success. Um, You know, that being said, I think the kids 
that I am talking about whose health and well-being are really at great risk, frankly, if they remain in a home all day with with parents who don't know how to parent. I I do think that there is a place for childcare for those children. You know, certainly, you know, you'd want to, to start a program with these mothers who have demonstrated maybe in the past, maybe they've already been dealing with child welfare services with other children, you know, that you'd want to sort of have a visiting nurse service program that would sort of help them try to understand how to parent better, you know, everything from how to monitor your child's health to reading to kids and things like that. But you would also want to be able to provide them maybe with high quality childcare. But again, I think that the agenda out there right now is let's provide childcare for everyone in the country. And I think, again, when we sort of make the agenda so broad, I think the risk is that we don't actually provide the things that we that the most vulnerable children in this country really do need. So let's turn to the issue of school violence, which is unfortunately increasing all over the country, especially in our urban schools. It seems like rather than enforcing behavioral standards with detention and suspensions, public schools are now increasingly turning toward so-called restorative justice. In your view, is restorative justice really working to improve student behavior? I don't think so. I think the evidence really suggests that restorative justice is creating a more chaotic environment in a lot of these schools. Uh, The studies that have been done suggest that the academic performance in these schools decreases um, and that students feel more afraid and the classes are more likely to be disrupted. Um, Restorative justice is really built again on this premise I mentioned earlier that the biggest concern is racial disparities. And so racial disparities in school violence led to this whole move to, um, oh, we have to stop suspending kids or sending them to detention um, because Black children in particular are disproportionately affected by these measures. Of course, as with crime generally, there's never any discussion about who is disproportionately committing these infractions. So, and by the way, I think when you control for things like family structure, you know, whether you come from a family with two married parents, the racial disparity almost disappear entirely. But I think that the the restorative justice really, uh, again, hurts the most vulnerable kids because, no, I'm not worried about the safety of my kids going to school. I live in a nice suburb with a good school district, but there are millions of Black parents across this country um, who live in uh, poor school districts and who do worry about their children's safety and who have to depend on school officials to be able to enforce the rules. And if they don't, Um, it is those children who are at risk. Finally, Naomi, for our last question, we call our podcast Next Round because PRI was founded in San Francisco and close to wine country. And so we'd like to ask all of our podcast guests for a wine, beer, or a cocktail recommendation for our listeners. So what are you enjoying these days <laughs> as you celebrate your new book? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, the, the, the joke in, in my household is that uh, I write these very depressing books that are going to drive people to drink. <laughs> so I'm not sure whether people are, are going to celebrate the book with a cocktail or just feel the need to drown their sorrows. Um, I'm I'm very much a, uh, a wine drinker. I, well, I don't know. Let's see. I'm drinking a uh, St. Francis wine these days, but I just, I find that uh, I, I can't, I can't in, indulge too much because uh, otherwise I, yeah, indulge too much. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.